Great. Well, that's what I'm here for. Uh, let me know whenever you want to get started. I'm happy to wait because I know sometimes, uh, at least at MIT, we're often on MIT time, which is five minutes past the hour. Right. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Pittsburgh uh, might be stuck in like 1954. So we're, we're, we're still working on <laughs> uh, getting everybody here. But yeah, let's give it a couple minutes. Anybody have any other exciting tech news to share? Anybody following the uh, the Reddit situation? <laughs> Hashtag eat the rich. <laughs> very, very much a fan. Yeah, it's I'm been seeing a random resurgence of GameStop. <laughs> yeah. That was awesome. <laughs> also like watching all of the other <laughs> stocks, I think like AMC's in the mix, but. Yeah, I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't know a lot about stocks. I'm Meanwhile, to... I like go over to my Coinbase and it's just like, you have negative $5. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm okay. trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get in the game. I don't know. Especially now, I was like, that happened. I was like, oh, I'm in it. I'm all in. <laughs> I'm going to make this a thing. Awesome. All right. We're going to start at 6.05. How about? Because um, I want to leave the last uh, 15, 20 minutes to matt to answer some questions and for us to be able to ask them um because i'm sure there will be quite a few um so let's see but yeah let me know if anybody's in on the big short you know <laughs> we do all our inventory on computer whoa that sounded crazy <laughs> <laughs> Not intense I don't know if anyone, uh, speaking of uh, random stocks, if anyone's into like Dogecoin, <laughs> yeah. is anyone, is anyone following I that? Not buy, uh... I'm not, I'm not, but, but I am watching it. I know, I guess it, it just really means I need more friends, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start a subreddit that's going to be just an invite to every, anybody who's attended our workshops. To, to help me short a market. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm going to make a subreddit to be like, should I or should I not buy Dogecoin? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I just need, I just need advice for one coin. Thank you. <laughs> so like, I've, uh, I haven't put on um, makeup in maybe like many months, but I was like, I'm the host. I'm going to I'm gonna make the lips pop, but then I like didn't know how to do that, so it like got like all over my face. So like the past um, like 15 minutes has me has been me like trying to like make it look like I didn't just drink like a vat of wine because um, I get really flush. So um, yeah, if I look like a clown, let me know. <laughs> Thank you. You're good. <laughs> All right, we're at 6.05. So I'm gonna mute everybody. Um, if you could leave your questions until the end and I'm gonna um, hand it over to Matt Grow. He's a researcher at MIT and is researching um, deep fakes. And uh, it's a pretty interesting and um, I think scary time for all of us when we really can't control our own image, um, especially in the perception of um, you know, not just the still image that we had with Photoshop, but now it's in video too. Um, and so one thing that I really found interesting about his research is that um, the emphasis on how our brains are really um, the best equipped to be able to parse that data, um, even over all the AI that's out there. So thank you guys all for joining us. Um, and I'm going to just hand it over to you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Shawnee, and thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here with you all tonight. I'm in Massachusetts right now, so it's kind of cool that we can uh, connect virtually. I'm going to share my screen to, uh, oh, can you, um, Shawnee, let me share screen? Hold on, now I need to log in. Learn how to do this. Oh, yeah. It says host disabled screen sharing. Oh, Jeepers. Okay. All right. Um, hmm. Anybody a Zoom god here? If you go, there should be like a security uh, button at the bottom next to like participants and chat. Yes. Oh, I like that. Okay. All right. And then yeah. there should be like a little option for screen share. Okay. Let's see here. Security. Screen. Okay, there we go. 
if no one could compete with the screen sharing, would be appreciated. <laughs> All right, now let's try. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Here we go. All right, here's what I have up, and it's going to be called the cognitive science of deep fake detection. And so, like Shawnee said, uh, actually, people might not be so bad at detecting deep fakes. Right now, we're really worried about deep fakes because we're worried about misinformation in general. It's a weird world when kind of the representation of reality becomes unhinged from reality. And so we see that in the way that the former president of the United States was talking about election fraud. We see that in the way the stock market's moving with uh, odd kind of companies of our childhood when we used to go to the mall. Um, and we see that in the representation in videos today with face swapping. And so deep fake technology is an example of face swapping technology. Let me um, kind of walk you through what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll give you a bunch of examples of what deep fakes are. It's uh, easy to describe. It's just face swapping technology uh, that AI can generate, but um, it appears in a bunch of different ways. And I think it's the best uh, to actually see what they look like to really get a sense. And I'm sure people have seen these, but I think some of the examples I show you haven't seen before. Um, I'm gonna talk about how we can build AI to detect deep fakes. I mean, if AI gets us into this mess with creating you know, this weird representation of reality with creating uh, fakes, maybe it can get us out. Um, but if it can't get us out, uh, maybe we want to think about how much these deep fakes actually convince us and persuade us and how believable they are. Um, and so I'm going to talk about some special things about uh, human visual perception. And uh, I think this will hopefully get you a little bit less worried and showcase some of the kind of special things um, that allow us to um, maybe recognize these kind of videos. And, and then we'll kind of think about how, how we want to feel about deep fakes at the end of this. Um, so, so to start with, I just want to share one that probably a lot of people have seen before. Imagine this for a second. One man with total control of billions of people's stolen data, all their secrets, their lives, their futures. I owe it all to Spectre. Spectre showed me that whoever controls the data controls the future. Now, that's obviously Mark Zuckerberg, but it's not him it's a representation of him saying something that he's never said before. And you notice that there's lots of things going on here. It probably looks like his body. Uh, there's a green screen behind it with what looks like, you know, his office potentially. And it looks like his face. It seemed like the things he said, it sounded like him. Uh, and these are the kind of things that we're going to have to look out for. This is like a highly produced a uh, really good one that really focuses on the lip syncing and the audio. Um, but uh, these, these are kind of like, this is an example. Not all are as good as this one. Uh, there's also kind of examples of uh, what I'll call um, photo uh, manipulations or synthetic photos. And so all these are people that don't exist. Um, and these are all generated by uh, a model, a generative model. And something that's interesting is on first glance, they look really, really real to us. But when we look kind of closer, we see a lot of things that are a bit off. And what's off is often the symmetry. Uh, and so if you look at their ears, you'll notice that, uh, for example, in the two uh, young children who showed their ears, the ears are very different. Like the bottom middle child has a really big um, ear on his right side and a small ear on his left side. And so these are some of the telltale signs, but basically it requires us to go beyond just the uh, what's it look like and have us think about what's going on here. It, it basically requires the slowing down process and saying like, why uh, is this being presented to me and should I believe it? So this is kind of the kind of question that we're gonna wanna continue to ask ourselves as we go on in a world where there's media manipulation possible like this. Here's another example of deep fakes uh, or of these uh, uh, generative models that produce images. You can actually interpolate between two different uh, fake images. And so on the top left is um, a generated image of a woman and on the top, uh, on the bottom right is a generated image of a man. And basically what this shows you is as you kind of like move your eyes down the screen, 
screen, you can see the woman turn into a man and uh, it kind of happens in this nice subtle way. Um, and, and this is one of the interesting things that you can do with these models. And so something to just think about, uh, not only can you face swap, but you can also go between faces. And so you can kind of face morph. So um, just to get an understanding of the technology, it also doesn't have to be about faces. Uh, this is a fun one. This is gonna show you a computer scientist dancing way better than the computer scientist really dances. So what you have is a source video of a real dancer. You use a model to detect the pose. And so what it's looking at is the limbs and the torso and how those move over time. And then what you're doing is you're basically mapping the source to the pose and then mapping the pose back to a target, to a different source, so to speak. And so what you see here is the computer scientist in the middle who is dancing really, really well. And likely she doesn't dance like that in real life, not like the professional in the source video. So one other example of how this can look. And, and this can have consequences. So here's a campaign ad um, from November 2020. This was uh, funded by a uh, congressional candidate in Florida. I want to start by professing my undying love for Rachel Maddow. Fox News sucks. QAnon is not real, folks. Read a book. Do you know why I hate Barack Obama? Obama is way cooler than me. He just is. As hard as I try, I can't grow a beard. I'm endorsing Joe Biden for president and Phil Ayer for company. No, this is not a Russian hoax. And no, Matt Gates didn't finally come to his senses. What you just saw is called deep fake technology. Russia and other hostile nations are running election disinformation campaigns against the U.S. right now to influence public opinion and wage war on the truth. If our campaign can make a video like this, imagine what Putin is doing right now. So there's an ad that a US congressional candidate ran back in, back in October. And um, the thing here is he admitted to creating a deep fake and it's quite obvious that it's a deep fake because all the things that uh, his opponent said are probably things that his opponent wouldn't say. Uh, but it kind of shows you what's at stake here. This kind of technology can be really dangerous. That's the last uh, deep fake that I'm going to show you and we're going to get into um, how to detect them. But I want to also mention that there's a whole spectrum of what deep fakes look like. And uh, some researchers have called this the spectrum of deep fakes to cheap fakes. Okay. And so it, it's nice and it rhymes. And so it's easy for us to remember. But basically we saw that voice synthesis uh, with Mark Zuckerberg and you know, the lip syncing. Um, and so that is on the more expertise and more technical resources required side of things. Um, that was actually done by uh, kind of a special effects team. And so you have that kind of stuff then you have kind of more standard lip syncing where you basically just take a video of Obama or Trump or Biden or whoever uh, online and then just lip sync over it. And you can figure out how to create a fake that way. Maybe you make it silent. Maybe you find a um, voice actor um, and you can do that or you can find voice synthesis technology. So all to say that there's often a combination of things that happen when we're doing this or when people are creating deep fakes. And there's even apps to create deep fakes. So if you wanna uh, make Mona Lisa talk or other uh, kind of fun things like that, like old people who no longer live and have them say interesting stuff, you can do that with certain apps that, that exist. Um, and so those are more in the cheap fix that you literally just upload the image to a mobile app and, and play around with it. So those exist too. And so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and you'd think that given machines are getting so good at perceptual tasks and so good at strategic games, uh, namely, you know, 
the best that there is an AI called Deep Blue back in the 90s that beat the uh, grandmaster in chess, Gary Kasparov. Um, but then it was thought, oh, well, you know, computers can't beat Go because Go just has a much higher possibility space than chess. Turns out a couple of years ago that DeepMind, which is a subsidiary of Google, uh, designed uh, a model that could beat the, the best uh, Go players. And not only that, but we're seeing that happen in poker. We're seeing that happen in, in StarCraft, real-time strategy games. We're also seeing that happen in medicine, where certain diagnostic tasks are, um, are being outperformed, um, or, or doctors are getting outperformed by computers in these tasks. So it could be about skin lesion detection and, and detecting cancer early. Um, but what's really interesting is a paper that came out um, last year, which showed uh, that a machine learning model could decrease both the false positive and false negative rate of mammograms. And so this kind of stuff is really, really useful in, in terms of making medical decisions. And so given that that's all the case, we would think, oh, well, AI might also be really good at detecting fakes, or at least probably better than us, or at least better than ordinary people. And, um, and so, you know, to solve this problem, Facebook and a couple other companies uh, said, let's, let's host a competition on Kaggle. Let's offer a million dollars in prize money to whoever can come up with the best model, the best computer vision model to detect uh, deep fakes versus uh, real or authentic videos. And so they hosted um, this competition for several months. I think uh, 2,200 or so teams participated. And um, it, it was a really neat um, data set too, because it was diverse across ethnicity, age, gender, um, and uh, what was also special about this data set, which is really important uh, as, as the field moves forward, is it uh, involved the consent of everybody in it. And a lot of times computer vision models don't um, involve the consent. People just crawl the internet, get a bunch of data and, and use it for uh, their computer vision task. And this one, everyone consented beforehand. So, so there's a lot of special aspects to this data set. There are um, also over 100,000 videos in this data set. So not only was it well incentivized, but this is the largest data set. Here, here's kind of a picture of um, the data set um, on a graph relative to other data sets of deep fakes. All these data sets are fairly new in the last few years. Um, in the top right kind of corner is the DFDC data set. And basically um, you see there's uh, 100,000 videos that's on the y-axis and, and a bunch of frames. Um, the, each video is 10 seconds long. So there's this data set, there's this competition, bunch of people submitted and the winning computer vision model accuracy was 65%. And so if you're just guessing randomly, you get 50%. And 65% doesn't sound so good. Uh, you know, just without any other knowledge about this, this sounds like, well, something's going wrong. If people, uh, if a computer can only get this right 65% of the time, we're maybe in trouble. Uh, so that's potentially the case. Um, but then the question is, how well would, would people do, you know? Um, Maybe, maybe actually people are way better at this and so, so we're in luck. Um, or maybe we're not in luck and, and this is just a tough thing. Well, we designed a website to figure this out. Basically what we did was we uh, took the data that uh, the deep fake detection competition hosted online and, and they put it out public so anyone can do this. You guys could download it too. It's on Facebook's website. And we downloaded a bunch of videos um, we randomly sampled uh, 50 of the 4,000 holdout videos um, for this. And uh, what we did was we made sure there's 25 real videos and 25 deep fakes. And then we just showed these videos, just like you see in this slide. And you can actually go to the website now or afterwards. It's called detectfakes.media.mit.edu. And uh, you basically just slide the slider to the left or right or leave it as is. You click submit. And uh, then actually after you click submit, we ask you to give another opinion. And this second opinion comes um, with the computer vision models prediction. So basically we're trying to see if um, supporting people, 
using these uh, model predictions as a decision support tool can improve uh, the way people detect um, deep fakes. And, and so you get this, you say submit again, and then you go on to the next video. And so uh, people play this uh, many times. And I think on average, uh, when people come to the website, they, they play it about 10 times or so, but many people play over 20 times. Um, and we've had We've had over 10,000 people come to this website. And, and so that, that presents like lots of data for us to analyze. Um, and so just to get a sense, um, I told you the 65% accuracy, or I told you the computer vision model was 65% accurate over the entire holdout set. Well, over the sample of the holdout set, people are just about the same. I think it's 0.66 or 66%. Um, over the specific uh, sample, uh, the computer is actually correct 80% of the time. So, so actually people are doing a little bit worse than the computer um, just on average. But when we look at, uh, there's many ways to look at this kind of data. So this is what the participants mean were. But if we look at the um, mean per video, then we actually see that um, kind of the crowd mean of participants scores is equivalent to the computer vision models um, accuracy. And so, um, so that's on those 50 deep fake detection contest holdout videos. But then the question is, okay, so maybe it's generally the same or maybe the computer's slightly better at those kind of videos. And I should say those kind of videos had no uh, kind of political effect to them. They didn't have any kind of thing at stake. They were all visual aspects, uh, like visual perception things, maybe a mustache or not a mustache. And, and it could have like swapped a mustache onto someone. Whereas we also showed uh, videos to the computer vision model and to people that had something at stake, some something kind of maybe dangerous or worrisome or anxiety ridden. And so here's one of the examples. Democracy is a pleasure thing, more pleasure than you want to believe. If the election fails, there is no democracy. I don't have to do anything. You're doing it to yourselves. So there's a video uh, purportedly of Kim Jong-un. And, you know, just think to yourself, do you think this is real? Do you think it's fake? And now given that we're uh, in a presentation about deep fakes, there's probably, you know, some bias that you have, okay, this is gonna be a deep fake. But imagine what other people might think when they see this kind of thing, especially imagine what someone who's not tech savvy is gonna think when they see this. This can be quite worrisome. And so, uh, oh, sorry. Turns out that the computer vision model uh, gives it a 1% likelihood that it's a deep fake. And participants who came to this website uh, give it a 47% likelihood that it's a deep fake. And so the 1% likelihood by the computer vision model is just confidently wrong. You know, the computer vision model thinks it's totally real and just totally misses the mark. The participants kind of don't know. And, and so this is this 47% mark is at 50%, you're saying 50, 50, maybe it's real, maybe it's fake. If you said, you know, 99% uh, likelihood deep fake, then you're, then you're feeling confident. So, so people in general don't feel confident about videos like that. Um, and so that's something interesting to think about of just what's going on in our world. Maybe we do want models um, to help give us support, but we need better models, ones that generalize beyond uh, this particular competition's data set. And so what's also interesting here is that the crowd wisdom, the kind of crowd mean is actually much higher. So, so about 70% of people get this correct. They say a more than 50% likelihood and, and quite a large number of people 
people, about uh, 25% have a above 95% likelihood that it's fake. So there is a good portion of people, and these are ordinary people. Um, we both did um, a experiment where we recruited people from a website called Prolific. And so we paid people to participate in this experiment, and we had 300 people come. We also had this on the open internet. And the results are very similar across those two populations um, that, you know, there is a good portion of ordinary people who are able to uh, confidently say this kind of stuff's fake. So one of the questions that I have in my research is what do humans and machines see differently? turns out that actually some of the things that computers got wrong, humans didn't and vice versa. And so why would that be the case? And, and what is it that we see? Well, I'll show you a case where human vision is not actually um, that awesome, um, or at least our immediate judgment after our perception is not strikingly awesome. And so that um, has to do with shadows. If you look at um, the top left box here, you see a red, a red object and blue objects and shadows associated with them. Likewise, on top right, you see the same thing, but the shadows are slightly different, okay? Well, both of those are realistic shadow situations. In C, in the bottom left, what you see is the same red and blue objects, but you see shadows that are unrealistic. Those, those shadows actually don't go together. You have the shadows of the blue objects in A and the shadow of the red object in B, okay? And so it, it's this like funny combination. And so obviously now that I've said that, you're like, okay, well, I get how these things can't connect because uh, obviously if A and B are correct, then C can't be uh, with respect to the shadows. Turns out that there's a way to kind of figure out how shadows should look. And basically you can draw these lines between the tip of the, um, tip of the shadow and the tip of the object and see where the focal point is. And I mean, this is assuming that there's only one light source or assuming there's only um, one sun, um, but it, it should all line up like you see in D. And so computers are actually quite good at spotting um, weird things like that. And people don't see this on first glance, though naturally that we've reasoned through this, we can understand that kind of thing and, and one could do that in the future, um, but it's not necessarily intuitive for us. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's intuitive in faces, but when you turn faces upside down, stuff gets a lot less intuitive. And so this is a picture of Margaret Thatcher um, from 1984. And uh, former, she's a former British prime minister. And you see these pictures upside down and, and they look kind of reasonable, right? There's nothing too weird about them, um, but I'm gonna flip them right side up. And what you see is something a little wild. You know, those eyes in the bottom right are freaky, okay? And and what what are those, why are those eyes so freaky? Well, those are actually, that's just the upside down version of what you just saw or the right side up version. And what it is, is those eyes have been flipped, okay? And so uh, what I mean by that is in the top right um, image, the eyes and the lips are flipped. And when we see eyes and lips eyes and lips in the right side up version on an upside down face, our mind doesn't process that it's wrong. But when we see a right side up face with upside down component parts, we think, oh gosh, that's weird. And so the reason is, is because the way we see faces is specialized you know, it's really helpful in life to be able to recognize faces. And evolutionarily, we, we've kind of like built uh, this ability to recognize faces. And there's even a special part in your brain that is associated with facial recognition. So um, this is all to say we have a special thing going on with faces. And this is going to help us think about deep fakes in a moment. But I'm going to talk about another aspect of specialized visual processing. And so Right now, you see kind of a combo of two people. And I'll give you a moment to kind of think about who these two people are. Uh, granted, this is from a paper in 2006. So you have to kind of think about who was popular back in the early 2000s or 90s and whatnot. Uh, these people are actually still well known today. It's actually a little bit easier when I split them apart like that. And 
I wonder how many people recognize it. I've, uh, I, a lot of people recognize it on the very first shot and, and a lot of people recognize it here, but sometimes it's a little hard. So on the left is Woody Allen uh, and on the right is Oprah Winfrey. Uh, and what's really interesting for a lot of people is when you see the person, when you see this composite like this, you can't do the face recognition because you're trying to interpret what's like missing and you can't because your face is already filling it, your mind is already filling in what that face looks like. But here you're able to fill in the rest of the face and then make the guess appropriately. And so just another kind of example, uh, and th this, this has been shown in research that these kind of split composites um, are much easier to recognize than the composite on top of um, each other. And so, you know, just another example of how visual processing for faces is special and um, helps us recognize people and, and can be tampered with. And so given that we can tamper with holistic processing of faces, uh, we thought, well, that maybe would allow us to study whether holistic processing plays a role in the detection of deep fakes by people, okay? And so what we did was we designed this experiment where on the website, you don't always see videos uh, upright and you don't always see videos um, that are totally reasonable. That we actually make three manipulations in these videos. And so, you know, we have a control group uh, like any good experimental design, but we also have three treatment groups. Uh, and this is kind of like an A-B test that you know, a lot of companies do. This is just a randomized experiment. And the reason we're randomizing is we want nothing to be different other than the fact that some videos are inverted. Some videos have a misalignment where basically you've split the face. So it's slightly offset and some have an occlusion over the eyes, basically blocking out the eyes. And then what we want to look at is, does this affect people's ability to detect deepfakes? And does it affect the computers, the best computer vision models ability to detect deepfakes? And so we ran an experiment and we randomize a bunch of different things. So we randomize um, the order in which videos are shown. We randomize uh, whether you know, the control or inversion or misalignment happen. And we also randomize um, an initial priming uh, set of questions. And so what we wanted to do was make this a little bit more ecologically valid. And basically on social media, there's a lot of emotions uh, that kind of kind of flail about. But um, in an experiment, it's, it's kind of devoid of emotion. So what we did was we um, did an emotional elicitation exercise where we basically asked people to think about a time when they were angry and, and tell us about the details of that. And, and this kind of exercise is, is pretty safe, uh, but it also uh, has been shown to uh, generally get people a little bit angry uh, during an experiment. And so, so we ask these kind of questions and that's why you see this control anger at the top. We show example videos to people, uh, make sure they understand what a deep fake is and what's not. We show them attention check video, basically uh, make sure they're paying attention. And then we show them 20 videos. And so let me show you the results. When we invert the videos, when we have that weird misalignment, when we occlude the eyes, we see a drop in people's accuracy. Turns out that that drop in accuracy does happen for computers when you flip it upside down, but it doesn't happen uh, in the misalignment or occlusion um, kind of treatment. And so, you know, this is some evidence to show that our specialized visual processing is actually at play in detecting these deep fakes and is actually really useful because what we're talking about is not the reasoning about whether some video is um, kind of polit like, oh, would Kim Jong-un really say this? Does he speak English? Um, does he look like that? What other kind of things, like who's the source of this? It's not about that kind of stuff. What we're talking about here is visual cues. So stuff like, uh, you know, whether the wrinkles on that person look reasonable or not, stuff like whether that person actually is wearing glasses or not, stuff like uh, whether their, their like mouth is really moving in the way uh, that, it, that it 
you know, that it appears given that they're speaking something maybe slightly different. And so it turns out that, um, you know, all these kind of manipulations do affect people, but don't affect computers as much. Um, and so, and it turns out also, I should say that um, when people um, are, are kind of triggered to emotion, at least uh, with, with thinking about angry thoughts, they also perform worse. Now that's maybe not so much a surprise, uh, but uh, it's something to think about for social media platforms when they're thinking about how to um, detect this kind of stuff. And, um, and so I wanna give a couple takeaways. And so those takeaways are, Ordinary humans can outperform the best machines. They don't always, they're kind of on par. Uh, and we haven't studied this for experts. So we don't know what like content moderators who think about this all the time um, or fact checkers who have really been trained in fact checking how they would do, but we do have a sense of how ordinary people would do. And it's generally on par with these machines and often beating them and, and not always uh, beating them. Um, but ordinary people's performance drops when, you know, holistic processing is tampered with. And uh, obviously that's not like going to be so uh, practical. Like why would someone create a deep fake where they're trying to tamper with holistic processing? So that's not what we're worried about here. What we're kind of interested and clued into is the fact that if human processing uh, or human visual processing relies on like this holistic aspect, then we want to think about building that into computer vision models. And we also want to say, hey, look, we actually have some good defenses against deep fakes. And so that's going to help us in the future. If we can just get ordinary people to look at a bunch of these videos, share their kind of opinions on whether something's real or fake, as long as we know they're kind of being honest and, and trying to help out, that actually might be better than hiring a team of content moderation people. And the reason I say that is because content moderation, when done out of moderation to the extreme, as in 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week, especially the way that some social media companies are doing it by outsourcing it to uh, people in other countries, can really be uh, damaging psychologically. And so if we can uh, more spread that burden uh, to more people and use wisdom of the crowds to solve this, that can be an effective solution that takes less of a psychological toll. And, and the third takeaway is that when you build experiments, you want to kind of make sure it's as ecologically valid as possible. And when we're thinking about what happens on social media, we want to be aware of what happens when people get angrier or, or have other emotions because it turns out that it actually decreases our ability to detect deep fakes from a visual perception perspective. So those are the key takeaways that I want to share. And then one kind of like bigger takeaway in this space, in this world of misinformation, once again, you know, there's so many different kind of avenues of misinformation in today's world. There's actually solutions and there's actually a lot of hope, I believe. And that's slow down and ask questions. And so basically, when you see something that doesn't make total sense, or even if it makes sense, you know, asking, well, who shared this with me? Why did that person share this with me? You know, why is this being reported in the way it's being reported? Could there be another side to this story? And, you know, a lot of stuff is just going to be truthful. Like, you know, most people aren't lying. And that's, that's a good thing, but it can happen. And, and it's just good to be aware. And, you know, maybe it's just give yourself an extra moment to reflect about what you're being presented with and, and, you know, make your own decision rather than letting someone else make a decision for you. So that's, that's the thing that I'd love everyone to take away. And I want to end with a quote from an amazing scientist, Carl Sagan. He said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And so, you know, we see a deep fake today and it shows something happen. For example, imagine a really, really bad scenario where uh, let's say there's a deep fake created of a US general burning a Quran. Okay, that would be very incendiary and possibly make a lot of people in this world very, very angry, right? And so we wouldn't, uh, hopefully that just doesn't happen. But if that does happen, What's important is that when people see videos, they say, hmm, 
why is this video being created? Would a US general really do this? Why would he do this? Is there technology that could do this for him or for somebody else who's trying to gaslight or trying to um, put their own agenda forward? Okay, if that's the case, then I'm going to not necessarily believe this and wait until I see more evidence about something. So I find that Carl Sagan's uh, perspective on this is very short and concise and can help us out. So that's that's what I got and I want to open this up to uh, to questions. I think it's always more fun to just uh, do the questions. And so here's a little art exhibit I did um, a year or two ago. And basically what it was was another kind of um, generative model where what we did is we detected people or different kind of objects in the image and then did something called in painting. And so we we just uh, replace the uh, person with the pixels that the computer otherwise expects to be around. And so it's just all the other background kind of things. And, uh, and then we created a kind of fun uh, art exhibit where we show these long shadows without the object that originally made those long shadows. So I so wanted to share that because I also want to uh, stop sharing my screen so I can see your lovely faces and uh, we can have a conversation. Thanks so much, Matt. That was, a, that was a lot of great information. I think my eyes like got really big for many different parts of it. I was like, ah! <laughs> um, I, so I'm, I'm gonna kick off questions because I have a bunch. Um, so um, my first question is kind of like um, in the space of um, like that research and also um, the kind of practice, like the practical usage of like facial recognition in that context too. Um, I'm just curious as to like what kind of, um, I guess research is being done in order to kind of give more like proven methodology. So if people are gonna like use something like, you know, terrifying like Clearview AI, what I guess, are they, are they making the effort to kind of like create some sort of evidentiary basis to that or are we still kind of in this space that like people are just kind of doing whatever and not trying to prove why they're using facial recognition or the efficacy of it does that does that make sense so is your question specifically on facial recognition or is it on kind of like fact checking more broadly um more i think like fact checking more broadly i think that was just kind of like an example of yeah. like the usage of of that um and so and how you know in in that context again like how you know somebody could be manipulated into believing that somebody did something that they didn't right um but then trying to use facial recognition as the as the kind of proof like there there's a breadth of space there that's really complicated and so i was just kind of curious as to what the conversations around that are yeah, yeah, that's that's a really great question. And so, you know, just in general, there's a lot of like truths that are hard to verify. Uh, and, you know, social media companies don't really want to be in that business because it's very difficult. And so there are these fact checking sites. And often you see in political debates, there's fact checkers that say, oh, what Trump or what Biden just said isn't actually exactly the case. There's some some nuances or maybe it's just totally not the case. Um, and, you know, one of the ideas is, oh, maybe we can use evidence based on like an image or based on a video or something like that, like, uh, you know, not all of us can be at the scene of a crime, but if we saw the video, then we can say, oh, that kind of makes sense. But the thing is, videos can be doctored and, and not just with AI manipulation, but, you know, if you, if you cut to the right scenes, you can really make something appear differently than it otherwise, you know, happened. And, and I think that's something that uh, we have to think about as like, you know, society is who interprets evidence, you know, because who interprets evidence is actually a very powerful thing. Uh, you know, the judge in, in a court case interprets evidence. But, you know, when a, a viral video is shown online or when, you know, uh, someone makes a claim that an election's uh, false, then, you know, we can all have our own opinion. And so thinking about how we should have our opinion is an important kind of thing. And once again, 
the, the conversations that I'm having are the slow down and think for yourself and ask questions kind of approach. And asking questions is a really good way to activate your critical reasoning and, and get people beyond the emotional, this fits with my opinion or doesn't fit with my opinion. And so therefore I'm gonna have this new opinion. Um, it's the, well, do you wanna be right? And so the best way to be right is being open-minded to potentially changing your opinion. And so, you know, the, I, I know this is like kind of not as maybe satisfactory of like, here's just a video recognition. And like, we saw this person, so we know they must be real. There's definitely stuff where people are trying to authenticate you know, a media piece. So basically there's like an image on the New York Times and you've authenticated it um, at, from like the source of the camera. But the thing is it requires um, you to buy into that system. The, that like, uh, the, basically when the camera took its photo, here is the like signature on that photo and it hasn't been altered since. Well, that probably makes sense within a trusted like organization. But once you, put this out to anybody, it gets a little bit more difficult to uh, say, well, how do we know that the original source was actually the original source? Um, and so because of that, uh, I think a lot of the best like approaches for anybody is this ask questions approach. Thanks. Does anybody else have any questions? Are you guys gonna make me go back to college and be that annoying one that's always like, and what about this? I guess so, all right. <laughs> all right, well then my follow-up is, um, so kind of like riffing off of that. Um, so I'm I'm curious about, um, so obviously like it's really come up, um, deep fakes have been really problematic in terms of like, like revenge porn and um, this kind of, of space of privacy and women in particular. Um, and I'm wondering if you've done any like research around that or um, if that's kind of like an active piece that that researchers are looking into. Yeah, yeah, there's that's a super active piece. I haven't done that kind of stuff specifically, but I know other folks at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center have been doing research. And so I mentioned there's a spectrum of deep fakes to cheap fakes. Um, and so if you check out the paper, I think it's by Britt Paris and Joan Donovan. Uh, those are uh, two really great scholars to check out. They've been doing a lot of work thinking about kind of the power dynamics of media manipulation and basically how we should um, think about who interprets this, why it's being done, how it's being used, what kind of like legal frameworks we should think about these things. Um, and it is really important. The, the way that I wanted to approach this kind of question was just, are people actually capable of detecting deep fakes? Because that's not, um, there's no evidence out there, a yes or no kind of thing. And we hear about deep fakes a lot. And I think a lot of times the way the media spins it is that we actually have no idea whether it's real or fake. Turns out that what I see is that people are not so bad on purely perceptual tasks. And so if they're not so bad on purely perceptual tasks, once you add in the reasoning component, people can be good. Now, whether they choose to be good or not is a different question. A lot of times people like to kind of create their own reality and, and not uh, kind of deal with the reality at hand, but that's, that's kind of a separate issue. And so what that means is when you have deep fake generated porn, a lot of people, if they see it, will probably have a good sense whether that was deep fake or not. They might not want to think twice about that, but that's, that's a different story. It's very true. And what about like grandma, whenever she's like, oh, I saw this video of Obama, you know, eating a baby or whatever. <laughs> crazy stuff and you're like that's clearly not true um is like i i mean i what i liked most about um your site and it gave me an opportunity as just like a user trying to convince people like hey let's let's go through this together that gave me the opportunity to say hey let's slow down and like let's look at this a little bit more objectively um and critically um is 
you know, are there other conversations that we can have with with people who are just like not convinced yet, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a matter of tuning in also, because I think, you know, you're obviously curious about this because you see how it can play out. And, you know, in the future, these algorithms are only getting better at generating this kind of content. And so it's something that we do want to prepare and be thoughtful about because, yeah, how, how are we, we're going to be blindsided if we don't think about it. But once we make it public knowledge, and once we see the ways that this kind of stuff uh, kind of does its tricks, we also start to accumulate like the, oh, look at those ears. Is one ear bigger than the other? This looks a little funny. Is, is there like a weird like background that doesn't like really make sense? Do all these things all kind of look the same? We start to like have all these nuances about what, like what is real and what isn't. And of course, you could imagine that someone actually has like a real image that has that weird blurry thing and someone has like one ear that's quite larger than the other. So it's not to say that that can't happen, but it's that we can kind of start to see these telltale signs. And we, we also know that this kind of um, information exists. And so I should say that this problem, while AI has scaled it up and made it in video form and social media uh, allows for, you know, this kind of stuff to move around a lot quicker, uh, it's not necessarily a new problem. Uh, in the 1980s, even before Photoshop, uh, National Geographic had this uh, great article where they were like, mm, you know, the pyramids of Egypt, we'd like to see those a little bit closer to Luxor and Aswan. And those places are actually like eight hours south by train. And so they just did a little Photoshop and, and put the two things together. And, uh, you know, this kind of stuff happens over and over again. There is a famous Time magazine article of uh, OJ Simpson where uh, his skin was darkened um, to make him look more like a criminal. And, and so this kind of stuff is being done and has been done for a long time for persuasive kind of reasons. And you know, what's important is to recognize what is the technology that's available. And once we know what the technology is that's available to do these things, we can then be a little bit more critical, basically saying, well, given that I see this, uh, and I know that the technology exists to potentially create this, I'm going to believe it maybe a little bit less because it could have just been created with technology. And so I think this like ability to think probabilistically about like, well, this could be true, this might not be true, but I'm gonna like believe it a little bit less or believe it a little bit more because it would be too hard to fake this kind of thing, um, I think can be a helpful way to think about um, the media content that we see. Awesome. Thanks so much, Matt. So we've got about um, six minutes. Um, are there any kind of like follow up resources that we can obviously going to um, detectfakes.media.mit.edu. Um, that's one of them. But um, yeah, if, uh, if you don't mind uh, reiterating the papers about um, the deep fake porn, um, like the revenge porn, that would be awesome too. Um, and yeah, um, I want to thank everybody for joining us and I hope you um, are able to kind of take this back to to all those, you know, aunts and uncles and <laughs> neighbors that you're like, hey, let's let's approach this conversation a little differently. <laughs> oh, Anthony, can I um, I kind of wanted to follow up about um, you had said um, with the technology that like exists in. Um, I would call myself like a I, like a decent coder. I've been out of school for like a couple of years, and I like I'm not great, but I think I can get the job done. Um, I'm also an artist, so spotting that kind of stuff kind of comes easy, just because I've drawn anatomy so much. What like what kind of like I like to understand the way I like to understand stuff is I like to get in and like like do it like what kind of stuff would you like get into to kind of like learn about making like deep fakes? Yeah, yeah. I think actually one of the best ways to spot them is to learn how to make them. And then you really understand the intricacies. 
And, and like what you said about being an artist, there are people who are kind of considered super recognizers and often they're artists because they basically spend so much time thinking about all these little details that when they see these kind of videos, they're like, oh, well, this is off on like seven different levels. Can't you all see? And, uh, and then someone who's not an artist is like, no, I, I don't know. So I, I, I do find that kind of interesting just how much variation there is across people. Um, in terms of different resources to learn, like so the first thing I would suggest is just doing stuff like, um, say, GitHub, like go to Google and say like GitHub, Python, and then deepfake. So that, that could be like a first step or like uh, GitHub, uh, deepfake, lip sync. And so then you get like a specific type of lip sync uh, or I mean a specific type of deepfake or do like face swap. You know, those kind of things are like useful things to Google. And there's also, but then you have to do a lot of coding to get that working and run it on a GPU and stuff. So it can be a little bit, um, you know, just like entailed. Uh, there's also, I'm forgetting what the app is called. Um, there's a, I'm looking up on my desktop right now, a pretty cool, it's called runway.ml. And so I'll, I'll put in the chat here. Um, and so basically what it is, is it's a um, platform that lets you use AI models um, without necessarily having to train them and just in a point and click basis. And it's really intended for artists to play around with the different kind of synthetic media generation technologies. That's super helpful. Good Thank you, I appreciate it. Cool. All right, well, um, I'm gonna give everybody their three minutes back tonight, um, but thank you so much for your time and um, your research and look forward to, to keeping up with it. And everybody go and test yourselves, see how good you are at detecting it. Cause uh, when I did it, I definitely failed. <laughs> and I'm sure my art professors would be like, well, that's why you went to photography and not, uh, <laughs> not drawing and oil painting. <laughs> So um, thanks again, Matt. And um, thank you guys all for your time. And um, we'll see you at some of our future um, workshops. Our next workshop coming up that's to the public will actually be on product management with Kelly Heiser, who built Rabble. Um, her company was Rabble and it built Music Cat, which is a part of the Carnegie Library Music Stacks program, which is really cool. And um, she's also my product manager at Beanstack, the um, Zoom. <laughs> Bean. So um, I'm looking forward to that. And um, yeah, again, thanks everyone. And we'll see you on the flip. Thank you, Matt.